Hey everyone and welcome back, ready to take a deep dive into the future. Always up for a little time travel. What do we have on the launch pad today? Well, we're strapping ourselves into a recent report that maps out the tech and social shifts coming at us over the next 10 years. Sounds fascinating. I'm sure our listeners are eager to separate the science fiction from the actual science. Exactly. So we'll try to unpack the biggest what if scenarios and there's some big ones. The really interesting part for me is seeing how these changes might actually connect and end up impacting your everyday life. You know, mm, right. Like it's one thing to talk about moon bases, but another to consider, say, if lunar mining takes off, how does that shift global trade mm. or your investments? Things like that. Exactly. The future isn't just about gadgets. It's about how those gadgets ripple out and change the systems we live in. OK, so let's hit that space exploration angle first. Everyone loves a good rocket launch, right? Always a good time. This report lays out some pretty bold timelines especially when it comes to SpaceX and their Starship program. Ah, uh, yes. Elon Musk's grand plans, they definitely get people talking. We're talking possible moon landings by 2026, maybe even sooner, who knows? Ambitious, for sure. And then Mars missions not long after. Well, that's the thing about SpaceX, they don't lack ambition, that's for certain. It's almost enough to make you want to dig out that old astronaut application. Ha ha ha, almost. But while SpaceX has got everyone's attention, it's important to remember space exploration isn't just about rockets and daring missions. It's about cold, hard economics, too. Right. Someone's got to pay for all this. Exactly. This report goes into this concept of lunar regolith processing. Okay, in English? Yes. Basically setting up factories on the moon to extract resources. This report focuses on aluminum. Wow, so like lunar mining. Exactly. If they pull it off, this could completely change how we think about global supply chains make space-based manufacturing a reality. That's wild. So instead of just visiting the moon, we're talking about using it to build, well, more stuff to go even farther out into space. Precisely. It's a bold vision, no doubt. It is. But it also makes you wonder, what if SpaceX doesn't quite live up to those timelines? Or what if politics get in the way? It's a possibility, sure. Space exploration has always been as much about politics as it has been about science. So are there any backup plans, so to speak? if the Musk-powered rocket to the future hits a snag. Well, that's where things get even more interesting. The report talks about technologies like spin launch. It's a system that uses a gigantic centrifuge to basically fling payloads into space. You're kidding, like a space trebuchet or something. It sounds crazy, but the physics actually checks out, and it could yeah. be a much cheaper way to get construction materials to the moon, for example. Okay, so less rocket fuel, more space slingshot. Something like that. The report even suggests that this tech could make ambitious projects like an orbital ring around the moon more feasible. An orbital ring. Now we're talking science fiction. Well, it's not as far-fetched as it might sound. Imagine a ring around the moon that we could use for transportation, maybe even power generation. Okay, so picture this. By the end of the decade, we might have a very different moon. Maybe even one with people living and working there permanently. It's definitely within the realm of possibility. This report highlights just how quickly things are moving. It really makes you wonder, right? Like, will we be seeing lunar real estate as the hot new investment soon? Uh-huh. That's a question for another deep dive, maybe. Fair enough. But while some folks are setting their sights on the stars, we've got another massive shift happening right here on Earth. Oh, absolutely. And this one is a little harder to predict. Artificial intelligence, right? Yep. And unlike those spacecraft we were just talking about, where we can kind of chart their course, AI is a bit of a wild card. Yeah, AI feels like it's advancing so fast these days. Almost every day, you see a new headline about some amazing breakthrough. But with that speed comes a lot of anxiety, too, I think. Oh, for sure, for sure. People are worried, and rightly so, especially about the job market. Exactly. Like, if you're a writer or a programmer right now, you're probably already feeling AI breathing down your neck. <laughs> you know what I mean? I hear you. It's not just about robots coming to take our jobs, though. Though, let's be real, that is a real concern for some folks. This report really stresses understanding that good enough threshold with AI. Good enough. What do you mean by that? So take those writers and programmers you mentioned. AI can write a decent blog post now, maybe even crank out some basic code. But can it truly replicate human creativity? Critical thinking, things like that. Okay, so it's about figuring out what AI excels at versus where it still falls short. Exactly. So the question becomes, what does that look like in your job? What tasks can be automated? And where is your unique human skill set still going to be essential? It's like all those predictions a few years back. 
Everyone was saying we'd all have self-driving cars by now. Ah, yes, the year the robots were supposed to take over. But it turns out navigating the real world is way harder than acing some computer simulation. No kidding. I bet building those truly versatile androids everyone keeps talking about comes with the same issues, don't you think? Oh, totally. But speaking of those AI-powered androids, that brings up a whole other issue that doesn't get nearly enough attention, I think. Oh, I completely agree. This is the big one. The whole safety and alignment thing. Like, how do we make sure that these crazy, powerful systems we're building don't somehow go off the rails? How do we make sure they're working with us and not against us, you know? It's the million-dollar question, and honestly, there are no easy answers. This report actually dives into how complex it is to even define good and harm when you're talking about AI. Yeah, that's a whole philosophical can of worms right there. It sure is, but it's a conversation we need to be having now. Absolutely. Okay, but let's shift gears from thinking machines to working machines for a sec. Sounds good. What did you have in mind? Robots. Everyone loves a good robot. Can't go wrong there. But it seems like we're still pretty far off from having C-3PO serving us drinks. Ha uh ha. -huh. Maybe a little further off than some of those sci-fi movies promised. So what's the holdup? We've had some pretty impressive advancements in robotics, right? We have. We have. But the hardware side of things hasn't quite seen the same explosive progress as AI software. Really? Why is that? It's complicated. This report actually suggests it might be a good thing, at least for now. How so? Well, instead of putting all our eggs in the humanoid robot basket, which is super complex, super expensive, and very energy intensive. Oh yeah, those things would probably drain your power grid. Exactly. We're seeing more focus on robots that specialize in specific tasks. Like what kind of tasks? Well, you've got your quadrupeds for navigating rough terrain. Those are getting really good. Then wheeled robots for logistics and deliveries. Makes sense. Get those packages delivered faster. Exactly. And of course, drones, those are already everywhere. Drones are definitely having their moment. So it sounds like, for now at least, specialized robots are where it's at. But what about the really futuristic stuff? Like, what about bioprinting? Bioprinting. Now we are talking. You know, like 3D printing, replacement organs, limbs, that sort of thing. It's felt like we've been on the verge of that breakthrough for a while. What's the latest there? It's definitely a field with mind-blowing potential. You're right. But it's also facing some really tough challenges. Especially when you're talking about replicating those super complex organs, you know? Like getting a new heart is a bit more complicated than printing a new phone case. Something like that. <laughs> This report seems to suggest that while we might see real progress in printing skin, cartilage, some of those less complex tissues. Okay, so like lab-grown skin grafts, that sort of thing. Exactly. But when it comes to a fully functional organ, that's probably still a ways off. Kind of a bummer, but I get it. It's complex stuff. But it makes you wonder, you know, like if we do crack the code on longevity, if we can actually start living significantly longer. Which is a whole other conversation. Totally. But if we get there, will we also figure out how to make those extra years actually good years? The age-old question, quality over quantity. Right? right. And that kind of ties into this bigger conversation about the future of healthcare in general, right? Like, how do we make sure everyone has access to these incredible medical advancements if and when they arrive? And what happens to our society if people are living to be 150, 200 years old? It's a lot to unpack, and it's all interconnected which is what makes these conversations so fascinating. I completely agree. It's not just about individual technologies. It's about how they all start to play off each other, you yeah. know, how they change the very fabric of how we live. And speaking of things that touch every aspect of our lives. Let me guess. We've got to talk about energy. You got it. Can't have any of this futuristic tech without figuring out how to power it all. And it's not just about generating enough energy either. It's about making sure it's clean, sustainable energy, right? Right. So where do we even start? What are the options on the table? This report dives into a whole bunch, but it starts with the dream, right? Which is yeah. fusion power. Okay. Yeah. That's been the holy grail of energy for what, like decades now? At least. And it always seems to be just over the horizon, doesn't yeah. it? So what's the latest? Are we any closer to actually making fusion a reality? Well, the potential is definitely still there. This report doesn't dispute that. I mean, you can't argue with n near limitless clean energy if we can actually make it work, right? Exactly. Yeah. The problem is, it's a really big if. This report seems to suggest that widespread use of fusion power is probably still quite a ways off, further than some people might hope, at least. What's holding it back? Is it just the technical hurdles? Those are definitely a big part of it. Fusion is really, really complicated stuff. But there are other concerns, too. 
This report actually mentions the risk of weaponization as a possible factor that could slow things down. Right, because if you can create that much energy... You can also create some pretty devastating weapons. Exactly. Right. So it's not just about making it work. It's about making sure we use it responsibly. What about some of the other ideas that get tossed around? Like, what about beaming solar energy down from space? Is that even a thing? Sounds like science fiction, right? It kind of does. Well, the report actually doesn't give it much weight. Calls it impractical, at least for now. Why is that? A bunch of reasons. For one, the cost would be just insane, like astronomically expensive. Yeah, that's usually a deal breaker. Right. And then even if you could build it, you'd lose a ton of that energy just transmitting it back to Earth. Ah, uh, so even if you could afford to build the space lasers. You'd be losing half the power along the way. Right. And then like we were just saying with fusion, there's the whole weaponization thing again, right? Exactly. You're talking about focusing a ton of energy on a very specific point. Not great. Okay, okay so maybe not space lasers. For now, at least. Okay. But on a more practical level, what about all the progress we are seeing with solar and wind power? I feel like every time I turn around, there's a new wind farm or a solar installation popping up. It's definitely not your imagination. This report highlights just how fast renewables are growing, especially solar and wind. Like, how fast are we talking? Well, they're projecting that solar and wind will actually become the main sources of electricity globally within the next 10 years. Wow. So surpassing fossil fuels completely. That's what the report suggests, yes. That's a pretty bold prediction. Yeah. But what does that actually look like for everyday people? Like, by 2030, are we all going to be driving solar-powered cars and living in homes that run entirely on wind? Well, the shift probably won't be quite that dramatic, at least not by the end of the decade. These things take time. But the transition to renewables, even if it's gradual, it's going to have some pretty big implications for, well, everyone, really. Like what? Give me an example. We'll take the job market. Think about it. As the demand for fossil fuels goes down, the demand for expertise in renewable energy tech is going to skyrocket. So we're talking new jobs, yeah. new industries even. Exactly. We're talking everything from installation and maintenance to research and development. So the takeaway there is, if you're looking for a future-proof career... Renewable energy is a good bet. Definitely something to think about. Hmm. But even if we do manage to pull off this energy transition, even if we can generate all this clean energy, there's still another bottleneck we have to deal with, right? Ah, uh, yes. The grid itself. Exactly. Like, the grid we have now is already struggling to keep up. And we're just getting started with electric cars, smart homes, all that stuff that's going to increase demand even more. It's a huge challenge. This report actually suggests a pretty radical solution. Oh, what is it? A global power grid. Wait, seriously? Yeah. Like, one grid for the entire planet? That's the idea. I mean, that sounds unbelievably complex, not to mention expensive. Yeah, no one's pretending it would be easy. You'd need every country on board. We'd need a level of global cooperation we've never even come close to before. Right. Like, that's a whole other level of diplomacy just to get the project started. But, okay, let's say we could pull it off. What would be the benefit of something like that? Well, think about it. You'd essentially be able to smooth out all the peaks and valleys in energy demand and supply. Because right now, if one country has a surge in demand... They're kind of on their own. But with a global grid, if one part of the world has excess renewable energy, they can just send it to where it's needed. Okay, so it's about efficiency, making sure we're not wasting energy. That's a big part of it, but it goes even deeper than that. The report actually argues that a project this big, this ambitious, it could actually help bring countries together. So it's not just about sharing energy, it's about sharing resources, maybe even sharing ideas. Exactly. It's a pretty utopian vision, honestly. But, but a compelling one, too, right? Like, yeah. if we could make it work. If. But okay, that's the big picture stuff. Let's zoom back in a little. Let's talk about something a little closer to home. Like what? Well, let's talk gadgets. Let's talk about the future that's right there in our pockets and on our wrists. What's the future of consumer electronics look like? Consumer electronics, yeah. Always fun to think about. So what's coming down the pipeline? What's the next big thing after smartphones? Well, this report actually dives into some of the limitations we're running into. Oh, like what? Well, it talks about how we're hitting the ceiling on traditional computing power, specifically that Moore's Law thing. Okay, and that is, refresh my memory. Moore's Law, it's basically this idea that the number of transistors we can cram onto a microchip, it doubles about every two years. Right. Right. And that's why our phones just keep getting more and more powerful. Exactly. But we're reaching the physical limits of how small we can make those transistors. So the report suggests that Moore's Law, 
it's probably going to slow down, maybe even stop completely in the next decade. Oh, wow. So does that mean our phones and laptops, they're just going to stop getting faster? It's not quite that simple. While those traditional silicon chips, while they might be hitting a wall, there are some other really interesting avenues people are exploring. Like what? Give me the good stuff. Well, quantum computing, for one. That's a big one that this report highlights. Okay, quantum computing. That sounds familiar, but I'll be honest, it also sounds a little like uh, Star trek -y. It does, doesn't it? But it's real, and it has the potential to completely change how we think about computing power. So how does it work in, like, simple terms? Well, it's complicated, but the basic idea is that traditional computers, they use bits, right, which are either a zero or a one. Right, right. But quantum computers, they use qubits, which can be a zero, a one, or both at the same time. Both at the same time. See, now that is where I get lost. It's definitely mind-bending stuff. But the point is, this lets them do calculations way, way faster than any computer we have today. Like, exponentially faster. Okay, so less Star Trek, more like super-powered warp speed calculations. Yeah. I'm starting to see the appeal, but how would that actually impact me? Like, how would I even use a quantum computer? Well, imagine a world where those super complex simulations, the ones that take like days or even weeks to run on those massive supercomputers we have today. Imagine doing that in seconds on a device that fits in your pocket. Okay, now that is impressive. So what can we use all that power for? Pretty much anything. This report talks about medicine, material science. It could revolutionize finance, artificial intelligence. It sounds like quantum computing could be a game changer, not just for our phones, but for, well, everything. Exactly. It's still early days, of course, but it's definitely something to keep an eye on. Definitely. Okay, quantum computing. I'm adding that to my things that will blow my mind in the next 10 years list. <laughs> what else? Well, even if we set aside the really big leaps, like quantum, the technologies in those smartphones we carry around, they're still going to keep evolving at a crazy pace. Okay, so what are we talking about here? Faster processors, better cameras. All of that. This report highlights advancements in materials, science, battery tech, and, of course, AI playing a huge role. AI is everywhere these days. No kidding. Speaking of which, have you heard about this whole smart dust thing? Smart dust, yeah, I think so. It's like tiny little sensors yeah everywhere that's the idea we're talking sensors so small you can barely even see them and you could embed them in pretty much anything okay so like in my clothes in my food this is starting to sound a little creepy well yeah this report actually talks about embedding them in the paint on your walls so my house could be watching me that's not creepy at all there are definitely some big time privacy concerns that's one thing everyone seems to agree on i would hope so but the potential is huge too Imagine real-time health monitoring or environmental sensing or even just personalized experiences based on your surroundings. It's like, on the one hand, super cool. But then on the other hand... Kind of terrified. Exactly. Like, are we going to get to a point where there's just no privacy left? Where we're constantly being tracked and monitored by all this smart dust? That's the million-dollar question, isn't it? And it's not just about smart dust. Think about all the data that your phone already collects your browsing history, your location, even your conversations. Right. It's not like we need more data floating around out there. It's a lot to think about. And honestly, this is one area where this report, it doesn't offer any easy answers. Because there aren't any. Right. Like technology is moving so fast. Mm. How do you even begin to regulate something like smart dust? It's a huge challenge, but it's a conversation we need to have sooner rather than later, I think. I agree. Okay. So we've covered a lot of ground here. Space exploration, artificial intelligence, robots, smart dust, the future of energy, the works. If I'm being honest, it's a little overwhelming. It's a lot. And the crazy thing is, this is just scratching the surface. Right. Like, who even knows what kind of crazy tech they'll come up with in the next 10 years? That's the exciting part, though, right? It is exciting. It's also a little daunting, I'm not going to lie. Like, how do you even wrap your head around all of this? As someone who's, you know, lived through a few of these technological revolutions already, any advice for our listeners on how to navigate all of this change? Well, I think the most important thing to remember, it's not the future. It's not something that just happens to us. We have a say in how all of this plays out. Okay, I like that. So what can people do? How do we actually make sure we're shaping this future instead of just letting it happen to us? 
Well, it starts with awareness, I think. Like, yeah, keep up with the latest gadgets, be excited about the cool new tech, but don't stop there. Don't just focus on the wow factor. So like, don't just buy the latest iPhone because it's shiny and new. Exactly. Think about the implications. Think about the potential downsides. Read beyond the headlines. So basically, be informed, be engaged, and don't just accept the future you're handed. Exactly. Ask questions. Challenge assumptions. Love it. And don't be afraid to get involved, whether that's pursuing a career in tech, supporting organizations that are working on responsible innovation, or even just talking to your friends and family about these issues. Every little bit helps. I love that. Don't just witness the future shape it. That's a great note to end on. Thanks for joining me on this wild ride into the future. Anytime. It's been a blast. And to everyone listening, thanks for joining us on this deep dive into the next decade. We'll see you next time for another exploration of the ever-changing world around us.